Hey church family, welcome to Cornerstone. I'm Brian Smith, the community relations pastor, and I'm excited for us to worship and pursue God's presence together today. Whether you've been coming for a while or today is your first visit, whether you're joining us on campus or online, we are so glad that you are joining us. If you are a visitor, we love to connect with you and help you find community. For all of our in-person guests, we have connect cards in the back seat in front of you. You can fill out those cards and bring those to the info center located in the lobby and exchange those for a free gift. Our info center volunteers are also available to help anyone with questions or ways to connect with our community. If you're a guest watching online, visit the helpful connection links below this video. We would love to hear from you. Cornerstone, we believe in the importance and the power of prayer. Whether it be a request or a praise report, we want to come alongside you and speaking directly with God. If you want to pray with the entire church, we have whiteboards in the hallway where you can write out your prayers. If you need someone to pray with you today, there's a dedicated prayer room with volunteers available to hear your story. Even if you're online, we have a pastor waiting to pray with you in real time or reach out on our website link below. No matter how you share your need, your prayer request will be specifically prayed for and handled confidentially. We believe that another way we worship God is by giving back a portion of what He has so generously given to us. Your financial support allows our church to better serve God and serve others, both here in our community and throughout the world. If you're new or visiting, your gift to us is you being here today. But if you call Cornerstone your church home and you've come prepared to give, we have several opportunities for you to give as shown on this screen. We can't thank you enough for your faithful giving. As you can see, God is doing some awesome things here at Cornerstone. We'd love for you to jump in and be a part of it. Worship is going to begin soon, so let's take a few seconds and focus your attention on the Lord. Thanks again for being with us today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at church. I want to welcome all of you to Cornerstone Ministries. And if you're joining us on, online, we are so glad that you're a part of our service here today. Now, if you are a first-time guest, we are especially glad that you are here. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better. If you could just do us a favor, in the seat pocket in front of you, there's a Connect card. If you could fill out that information and you could do one of two things, you could drop it in the offering buckets on your way out the door, and you're our guest today. That's the only thing we want from you in that offering bucket. Or you could take it to the information center located in the lobby and exchange that for a free gift. And again, we're so glad that you are here and we hope you feel at home. And I can't wait to worship with all of you today. Now, uh, before I leave, uh, I want to point out on the 16th, we have the March for Life in Harrisburg. It is the most important issue of today, where we can go and be a voice for those that can't, those babies that can't uh, speak for themselves. So check out this video and hear Pastor Don's heart. Hello, church. Isn't this a great time to be alive? And you know why it's a great time to be alive? It's a great time to make a difference. And there is no better way for us to make a difference right now than to attend the March for Life on October the 16th in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. You know, since the Roe v. Wade has been overturned. The, the issue of life now is a state issue in every state, and that's why we're going to Harrisburg, where our state has its capital. And I hope you'll go and be with me. You know, when our founding fathers declared that all men were created equal, they, they did an incredible thing. Because, up, you know, it's only the sanctity of every human life that separates us from barbarianism. And so the worth and dignity of every human life, there's no doubt where it begins. It begins in the womb. And our pro-life senators and representatives need to hear from us that we've got their back and that they can stand boldly for life. And the world needs to see the streets of Harrisburg filled with the people of life. And that's why I'm coming to you and asking you to march with me. The babies are worth our time and they're worth our effort. 
A.W. Tozer said, a sacred world needs a fearless church. Let's be that church. Listen, if you're unable to go and you want to give a scholarship, well, that's great. Give us a scholarship instead. And if you need a scholarship and it's only the 50 bucks that keeps you from going, I want to tell you that those scholarships will be available. So let's all get together. Let's go to Harrisburg and let's make a glorious difference and let's save some babies. Hey, church family, uh, I want to tell you about something special we have coming up. You know, I, I really believe that as we encounter the presence of the Lord in worship, that we become more like him and that he changes us and, and helps us and heals us and meets us in those moments. And I want to invite you to, a, to an all-church night of worship that we're going to be having together. It's October 1st. It's Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and I'm excited for us to take some time and pursue his presence together. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Hi, I'm Jenny Marsalis. And I'm Sarah, and we're from the Children's Ministry Department. Our annual Fall Fun Fest will occur on Friday, October 13th from 6 to 9 p.m. Registration will open on Friday, September 15th. Please make sure to register your entire family so that we can make sure your children get a treat bag filled with goodies. This year we will have over 25 carnival games, a petting zoo, three new inflatables, food trucks, bingo, temporary tattoo station, lots and lots of candy, and so much more. This is the perfect opportunity for you to invite your friends, your family, your co-workers, or anyone you know who, who doesn't know Jesus. They get to come and experience Cornerstone. They see the church, meet its people for the first time. So bring your whole family, invite some friends, and enjoy a night filled with faith and fun. And candy. Hey, did you know that God has hardwired us for relationships? He's designed us to be in a relationship with Him, and He's designed us to build relationships with the people around us. And at Cornerstone, we want to cultivate those relationships, and one way we do that is through small groups. So make sure you go on the Happening Now page and you sign up to jump into a small group this fall as we go through our King series looking at the hearts of Judah's rulers. As a single person or as a couple, jump in, build a relationship with other people, and grow deeper in your walk with Jesus.
It is an amazing thing to be able to trust in the Lord, amen? To be able to put our hope and our faith and our trust in who he is, and he doesn't fail. Like, I, I, I honestly, like there are certain things about like our humanity that I, I think limit us in our comprehension, and I think this is an area, like God doesn't fail. And I, I think that's a hard thing, a hard concept. It's hard for me, I won't put that on you. It's hard for me to understand. The idea that God doesn't fail, he never has, 
He never will. will. And I, I know maybe I can't grasp all of it, but I will tell you what, I am excited about it because that has implications for me. That's, a, that's amazing. That means the work that God promised that he started in me, he's going to finish. He's going to complete. Isn't that awesome? Same for you too, not just me. I, I know I was, you know, but right? Like we can celebrate that today. God in all of his goodness and who he is, he never fails. Even in the midst of a, a, a crazy, crazy world, God is faithful. He is the same. He was, he is, he is to come. Isn't that awesome? That's the God we're worshiping to. That's the God that we're singing to today. And I just wanna tell you, if maybe there's something that's kinda hanging out there. I know life isn't, isn't all cleaned up and pretty and wrapped in a bow, and when we come in this room, like, there's stuff, right? Like, there's a messiness of our lives. And uh, God wants to meet us in all of that. And I think there's so much beauty there. And, and my hope is today that, just ask him, even as we continue in worship, just ask him, Lord, I need to see you in this. And I know he's gonna show himself faithful. And we're gonna, we're gonna sing a, a, a kind of a, a new song that's kind of part new song, it's kind of part hymn. It's got some lyrics and I thought it'd be really good if we just learned the, the chorus together. So uh, I'll teach you, it goes like this. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who That's it, sing that with me. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Sing it again. I trust in God, my Savior.
hasn't brought us this far to leave us alone. of your praise today. In the name above every name. Come on, let it ring in this place. Come on, give it praise. God, we do give you honor and glory. Our hope is that you're blessed in this time. God, thank you for being here. Thank you for hearing us when we call. God, you are so good, so loving, so strong. You call us to things and you, you heal and restore. And we just, we thank you for all that you've been doing as we've been worshiping you. And God, we just say, Lord, let your kingdom come. Keep it up. Let your will be done. All for your glory in Jesus' name.
Say it with me, church family. Amen. Amen. Well, again, uh, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. So glad to worship together today. And uh, my name is Trent, if we don't know each other. And um, worship pastor here at Cornerstone is great. And, and really, our hope is just to encounter the presence of the Lord together because we know he's so good. Amen. All right, well, why don't you say hi to a few people around you, and then after that, you can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, church. Excited to be with you. I love that last song, uh, that, that bridge. I sought the Lord, and he, and he heard, and he answered. Um, I didn't seek him, but for some reason, he, he chased me down. Is that anybody else's story? May I praise God for that. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to, to be with you. Um, the last time uh, I was supposed to preach was the middle of summer, and I woke up Saturday morning with laryngitis, and Pastor Don was able to take my notes and, and just kind of run with it. Um, and I proceeded to get one of the greatest compliments of my life, which is being compared to the Godfather. Um, but if you're, if you're Italian, you should be deeply offended that me being heavily Scottish and Irish is, is given that comparison. Um, but I'm excited to be with you. Um, this past week, um, my family and I, we were able to go to Indiana and I was able to attend a pastor's conference and it, it was just so refreshing and, and the Lord really restoked some, some fires uh, within me. So I'm so, so excited to be jumping into the word together and apart from my, uh, my wife and, and kids preaching the word and, and teaching the word is hands down one of the greatest joys of my life. So uh, I'm so excited to, to dig into this together. But um, as I was at this, this conference, it really reminded me of where I feel like there were seasons of calling on my life and where I felt like God was leading me and, and trying to figure out, okay, God, what is it you want me to do? And so I got saved at this summer camp right before I went into high school. And I started working at this camp every summer for about six years. And, and during this kind of transition from high school into college and even through my freshman and sophomore year, I wrestled with whether or not I felt like the Lord was calling me into full-time ministry in a local church setting or if he was calling me to a camp setting. And obviously here we are. And it's, and it's funny because actually today is one year since my family and I moved here and, and, and started and we're so excited about where we're going and what the Lord has for us and for this church. But as I was kind of wrestling with, with this idea of calling and I was spending my summers working at this camp, every year during staff training, they would separate out the male staff and the female staff during our staff training week. And we would have like a sex talk, a purity talk. And as our, our kitchen staff was 16, 17, and then the staff went all the way up to about 22, 23. So you can imagine about 30 or so young boys, young men, 16 to 22, sitting and getting kind of the sex talk from a 70-year-old man who was the director of the camp. It was just kind of like, mm, this is uncomfortable. But he said something within that conversation that I hung on to is that you can let the bird land, but you can't let it make a nest. And if you're like, what the heck are you talking about? Just hang with me for a second. 
There's a, a really good series of books, and if you're struggling with lust, if you're struggling with purity, uh, I would strongly encourage you to check these out. But Every Man's Battle, Every Young Man's Battle, Every Woman's Battle, just a great series of books. But in Every Man's Battle, the author articulates this idea that we cannot control the first look, but it is the second look or the continuation of looking that we are responsible for. So the notion is... You don't really have control if an attractive person walks into your line of sight, but what you are responsible for is if you keep looking or if you double take or triple take or whatever it might be. And that's that concept that this camp director was kind of putting out there. You can't control if a bird lands on your head. You can't control a a thought that just pops into your mind, but you have the responsibility to not let that stay, to not let the bird make a nest. So now you're like, oh, I get it. Now I get the analogy. Okay, the reason that I wanted to start with that story is because as we've been going through this series, Deep Clean, and the Lord has led us in some awesome moments and the Holy Spirit's been speaking through Pastor Don as we're trying to not only uproot sin out of our life, but all the repercussions of it. All the ramifications, the anxiety and the guilt and the the fear and the hurt and the hate. And this morning we're talking about worry. And maybe this was just me, but during this series, there were a a few moments where it was, well, I don't know what to do with this because it's kind of unavoidable. Some of these thoughts and some of these difficult emotions, they just pop up randomly. And I feel like I don't have control over them. And there's a reason Paul uses this language in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. He says what? Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Because your thoughts can pop up. They can lead you astray. They can pull you in some weird directions. So as we, I want you to keep that in your focus as we dig into this. But as we talk about worry, one of the kind of the go-to passages that people often run to is Matthew chapter 6. And I want to look at that together. Matthew chapter 6 starting in verse 25. If you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along on the screen. Um, But church, let me encourage you that this is uh, the word of God breathed out by God. If you do not own a physical Bible, please stop by the info desk, grab one of our pastors. We wanna make sure that you have one. And I strongly encourage you um, to have a physical Bible with you. Um, So then when I say, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 6, we hear this silent rustling of pages um, or we just have the warm glow of your ESV or your U version on your phone uh, as you're looking at your Bible on your phone. But Matthew chapter six, starting in verse 25, it says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious. And that word anxious, marinao, it's better translated as worry. But in the translation that we have on the screen, the ESV, uh, it is translated as the word anxious, but worry is that word there. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. And why are you anxious? Why are you worrying about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. This is King Solomon, son of David. We're we're sought to seek after his wisdom, uh, but he had a lot of money as well. He was a very wealthy king. And kings would have particular attire for certain celebrations. So when it says Solomon in all his glory, it's basically saying Solomon, even in his Sunday best, his fanciest, you know, attire that he has. So even Solomon in all his glory, this king in his finest attire was not arrayed. It was, he was not as beautiful like the grass of the field. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, they seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 
Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, church, as we look at this passage, like I said, that word anxious, every time it pops up, we can think of the word worry. And that word marinao, it kind of in its base form, it means care. That you're giving care, you're giving attention to something. But here's what's so interesting about this, is that the root of that word, you go another layer down, it actually means split or division. So when it says, do not be anxious, do not have a divided mind, a split mind, this is where we need to start. The fact that sometimes our worries are unavoidable. There are unavoidable worries. We have outside influences that bring thoughts into our mind that we had no plan to focus on, but for some reason it grabs onto our attention. And sometimes these earthly emotions and struggles, our worries are completely unavoidable. You know, if you have the same exact spot in your mattress that you go to lay down in, you know it's kind of sunken in a little bit. And you, you know it's terrible for you, right? Like by the time you wake up in the morning, your neck's sore, your back's sore. But at least for the first few minutes, once you find that spot that you've kind of like sunk in the mattress in a little bit, it's so comfortable. At least for a minute, and you pull the, the blanket up to your neck. I, okay, last night and the nine o'clock, I said duvet. And, I, and one of the men after service were like, what the heck are you talking about, a duvet? Uh, ladies, explain that to your fella, please. And fellas, go buy one for your wife. You have unlimited brownie points for the next week if you do. But you pull the blanket up to your neck, and I personally, I stick one leg out just to keep the body temperature a little low. You know exactly what I'm talking about if you do it. If you're thinking at this point, like he's going into way too much detail on how he sleeps. Listen, Holy Spirit takes over, and I can't, Sorry. But as soon as I get into that comfy spot, I hear, hey, did you check the baby gate? (laughs) Throw the blanket off. And luckily I can see the baby gate from our door. So I open the door. Yes, I shut the gate. We have stairs going going from our front door down to our driveway. We get all the kids loaded up in the car. I come running down the stairs. I jump in the car. Click, click. Hey, did you lock the front door? (sighs) Let me run back up the stairs, check the front door. And in those moments, when I lay down at night, I'm fully confident that the gate is shut. When I hop into the car, I'm fully confident that I locked the door. And my wife asked me a question, a subtle question that creates division in my mind. It brings me just a little bit of worry. My wife is sitting front row. I told her I was going to use this as an example, and she's totally fine with it, so... But church, the point I'm trying to make here is that sometimes we have outside influences news stories and ads and situations, just fleeting thoughts that for some reason we catch on to and our mind becomes split. We become divided in our thinking and that's where that worry sets in. Hey, I feel so confident about my, my grown child is now choosing this college. I'm so excited it's a Christian school, but at the same time, what if they don't fall in with the right group of people and it actually hurts their faith more than helps it I'm really unhappy at this job, and I, and I think I have the opportunity to change jobs, but what if I end up not liking the new job? And man, there's so many incredible qualities I see in our, in our kids, but at the same time, when we drop them off for children's church, I feel like they're so misbehaved compared to the other ones, and we wander through life with these divided thoughts, with worry. Now, week one, we talked about anxiety, And kind of what's the difference there? So worry is completely cognitive. It is your thought life. Anxiety comes into play where it starts that worrisome thinking begins taking over your emotion and you even have a a physical response. So worry is a piece of anxiety. So there's almost this notion of, well, if we can tackle worry, it's uh, it's gonna completely benefit how we wrestle with anxiety. But this concept that worries are unavoidable, they just pop up. So how am I going to take them captive? How am I going to respond to them? Well, Matthew 6 gives us that perspective. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because church, when we look at Matthew 6, at first glance, Jesus is giving this sermon saying, hey, look at the birds. They get fed. Look at the grass. It's beautiful. So don't worry. And if you ask my wife, the worst thing I can do and sadly have done in many different instances when she's worried about something is I have a very kind of nonchalant, well, don't. 
Just don't. It's that easy. Just stop. And it's not. And ladies, I'm sorry, you've, you, you kind of got the, the short straw there, but you got to blame Eve. But you go back to Genesis 3 and the curse. There's this repetition, right? God looks at Eve and says, I will greatly increase your pain and childbearing. In suffering, you will bring forth children. The second appearance of that word. Well, why the pain and suffering? Isn't that kind of the same thing? No, it's a different word. It's a different Hebrew word. And suffering actually means an emotional and spiritual turmoil. So ladies, you have been hardwired in sin to worry more than guys. But fellas, we do, as providers and protectors, we, we worry as well. So these dividing, consuming thoughts plague us, and it's so frustrating. It can get so frustrating. But 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 7, let's look at this together. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Casting all your anxieties on him. Church, listen, if it is big enough to be on your mind, then it is on God's heart. He wants the little things as much as he wants the big things. So if you're a student and you're stressed out about a test you have tomorrow, he wants that just as much as he wants a family member that's battling cancer. He wants all of your anxieties, all of your worries. And that word in First Peter, it's the same one in Matthew 6. This care, everything you care about, everything that consumes your thought life and divides your focus, he wants it. He wants all of it. But the end of that Matthew 6 passage Because like we said, at times it kind of looks like Jesus is just saying, well, hey, don't worry. But this is where we kind of, we lose something in the English language because that word, but seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you. That word seek, it actually means to meditate, to crave, to demand the kingdom of God. So as worry divides our mind and divides our thinking and we see, we feel pulled back and forth in these competing directions... Jesus' response is, I want you to shift all of your attention on me. I want you to think about that, the, the hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. When we seek, when we meditate, when we demand the kingdom of God, the righteousness of God, we bask in the beauty of who God is, these worldly things, they fade. And where there was once division, there can be fullness. And that is that Greek word for assurance. That's the transition there as the Lord takes us from worry to assurance, from division to fullness. He brings a unity of the mind when we shift our attention off of these things that are unavoidable. They pop up. But we take those thoughts captive, we make them obedient to Christ, and we shift our focus back on the Lord. I want to look at Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23. I love Hebrews, beautiful book of the Bible. The, the entire point of the book, Jesus is going to be, is a better Moses. Jesus is the better David. And Hebrews bounces back and forth off of the Old Testament. And it serves as this beautiful illustration of how the entirety of the Bible is one fluid story. It is one story all pointing to Jesus. So Hebrews is such an awesome book. In Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23, it says this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. And what the author of Hebrews is referencing there is that curtain that separated the temple from the holy of holies. The holy of holies, the place where only the high priest could go, to be in the full presence of God, separated by a veil that was a hand breadth thick, about four inches. So a four inch thick veil torn from top to bottom at Jesus' crucifixion, during Jesus' crucifixion. So now you and I have complete, unhindered access to God, to the full presence of God. That's what he's referencing. That is through his flesh. We're jumping right back into the middle of the passage here. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, 
let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith, that assurance, it means fullness, but it also means a confidence and a certainty. So we can draw with confidence of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Ephesians 1 verses 3 through 4. I love this. Let's let's look at this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Everyone, every single one, yeah. And the concept of these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places means that he is giving to us a fullness of grace and mercy and love and joy to depths that you and I cannot begin to fathom. We cannot even begin to process it, which is why when we talk about the love of God and the fact that it can completely wash over, cover a multitude of sins, we go, no, we don't fully buy it. We don't fully believe it. Why? Because it's such a depth of love that we can't process because it is a spiritual blessing even in the heavenly places, everyone. But I love this. This is so cool. Look at this. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Look at how this is laid out. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has already blessed us. He has already given you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Why? So that you will be holy and blameless. Why is this so important? Paul is not saying you need to be holy and blameless and then you get the blessings. He's saying, I'm going to give them to you out of the goodness of my being. And that is going to create in you holiness. And church, let me be clear. This is not material blessing. But the love and grace and mercy and kindness and goodness of God, depths of which we cannot begin to imagine, he blesses with us. And then he says, now I want you to take this and I want it to shape you, to make you holy, to make you blameless. This conference that I was at, the theme was hope in the wilderness and we walked through the entirety of the book of Exodus. And I want you to think about this. As Moses brings the nation of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery, after they're in the wilderness, after they've been freed, Moses goes and communes with God on Mount Sinai and he comes down with the Ten Commandments. And how beautiful is that? He frees the nation of Israel, said, me freeing you, redeeming you, rescuing you, that does not depend on your ability to follow the commandments. How do we know that? He gave them to the nation of Israel after the fact. I've already freed you. Now, as you walk with me, I want to start creating in you holiness. And here are the commandments on how you do that. So he's giving us every spiritual blessing, and that does not depend on us, but it flows out of his character. But here's where we need to be careful. We cannot abuse assurance. That confidence of faith, we cannot abuse that Philippians chapter two, starting in verse three, it says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves. Have the, this mind, and a mind that puts others' interests above yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he, Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That word grasped actually means to seize. It's the same word used for robbery, to steal. So Jesus not abusing the fact that he is God and very much so, could claim an equality with God, he does what? He humbles himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he calls us to that same standard of living, saying, do not abuse my grace. Do not abuse the assurance that I am giving to you. Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? 
are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Now, church, let me be clear. You and I will never be perfect this side of eternity. We are going to sin. We are going to fall short and stumble and make mistakes. But there is a difference between committing a sin, stumbling, falling, and living in it. Immersing yourself in it. And if we're saying that I have become one with Christ, I've put my old life to death, well then, if you are no longer dead, then your body should stop decaying. You should stop having the effects of death. You cannot live in sin and abuse that grace, that assurance. But even as we process this worry and the assurance that the Lord wants to give us, you know, for a moment, we can look at those earthly worries and the things that, those unavoidable worries and thoughts that pop into our head and we think, okay, great. God wants to give me that word assurance. It means confidence. He wants to give me confidence. Fantastic. So in those moments where I'm worried about something, I can turn to him, great. Uh, but what if God doesn't keep his word? And we've been free of worry for about 30 seconds. <laughs> and now we're worrying about something completely different. And frankly, the earthly worries are nothing. They are so minimal compared to having a confidence in our relationship with Jesus. A certainty of our faith that we can approach him boldly. But here's what you and I need to understand. Is that our assurance is sealed by the one giving it. Because that word assurance, this is so cool. I love, we, we lose so much in the English language. That word assurance it also means a promise and a covenant. So when he says, I'm giving you an assurance of faith, he's saying, I'm giving you a covenant of faith that I am instituting that you cannot undo. So our assurance doesn't depend on us. It doesn't rely on us. Now, marriage is such a beautiful thing. It is a representation of Christ's love for the church. But that is a covenant that he instituted. What God has brought together, let no man separate. And there have been times and seasons where my wife and I have felt insecure in our marriage and insecure in our relationship. And when I look back on those times, when I look back on those seasons from both sides, is that all of those insecurities had absolutely nothing to do with my wife. The moments that I was insecure had nothing to do with my wife because her vow to me, her commitment to me, that she made and took before God, ordained by God, I am just a receiver of. And we fail at this. And in our stubbornness, all the way back in the wilderness, God basically says to Moses, because you are so stiff-necked, there are some rare occasions where I will allow you to separate when there's unrepentant, unfaithfulness. But we need to understand, by and large, that the covenant of marriage is something that we have no right to redefine and restructure. We have no right to rewrite this document, this this." covenant that God has established. We have no authority to do it. But I can stand firm in my relationship with my wife because she has vowed to me, made a promise to me, made a covenant that I am the benefactor of. That before the Lord, she will love me no matter what. And that is such a beautiful example, but it is a limited one. Because the covenant God has made with us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. It has nothing to do with me. So the fact that he has redeemed me, the fact that he has brought me up from death, that wasn't done by my blood, that was done by his blood. That's why he is a perfect sacrifice. To kind of drive this home, I want to look at the book of Hosea. I want to spend a little time in Hosea. We're, we're going to be focusing on, on uh, Hosea chapter 3 and a little bit on Hosea 14. But Hosea is one of the minor prophets. 
And the church, the minor prophets are only called minor because of the lengths of the books, not because they did insignificant things. And next week, we're jumping into our king series, and we're going through the kings of Judah. But after King David and after King Solomon, you have the kingdom becomes divided between the northern and southern kingdom, the nation of Israel, and the nation of Judah. Hosea was primarily a a prophet over the northern kingdom. And like the the historical context of Hosea in his books is during 2 Kings uh, 14 to 20 and 2 Chronicles 26 to 32. And we can get lost and confused in the Old Testament because we think it's chronological. No, they they overlap, they weave together. Like I said, it is one beautiful, fluid story. But Hosea is speaking to the nation of Israel. And if you read Hosea, he kind of bounces back and forth between addressing saying, Oh, Israel, and saying, Oh, Ephraim. Ephraim was the largest tribe in the nation of Israel. So when he's saying, O oh, Ephraim, he's just referring to the nation of Israel in another way. But Hosea is charged by God to let his life stand as this massive sermon illustration. And he says to him, this is Hosea 1 verse 2. It says, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. And the context of this is scholars have kind of come to believe that the wife he takes, her name is Gomer, rough name. Just, if your name's Gomer, you need to talk to your parents because the only historical context I can understand is is a biblical prostitute. So why did they give you that name? I do not know. But frankly, the other names laid out in Hosea are no good either. Because he goes on to have a son, his first son, and the Lord says, name him Jezreel. All right, that's not bad. The second, son, the second child, a daughter, he says, I want you to name her No Mercy. All right, this is getting worse. After No Mercy, third child, I want you to call this one Not My People. Like, just if you're pregnant or trying to get pregnant and you're like, just don't go to Hosea for any name ideas. Hosea is fine. You can use Hosea if you want to, but just there's so many good Bible names. Just don't go there, Okay. But God wants to use Hosea as his life as a massive sermon illustration. So he says, Hosea, this is what I want you to do. I need you to be faithful to this woman. And like I said, she most likely was not a prostitute before they got married. So fellas, imagine standing at the altar. You see your beautiful bride walking towards you. And in every fiber of your being, you know she's going to cheat on you. I would not stay at that altar. But God says, no, no. I want you to do this anyway. They get married. They have these children. She goes off, sleeps with all these other men, prostitutes herself out. Hosea chapter three, God says, and the Lord said to me, this is Hosea three, verse one. Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. That's really confusing. At the end of that verse, cakes of raisins, what do they have to do with anything? That's just a symbol of idol worship, of pagan worship. So he's saying, listen, they're off worshiping other gods the same way your wife is off sleeping with other men. And I need you to go get her, just like I'm gonna come get the nation of Israel. And through the book of Hosea, you have, he's known as this prophet of doom because there's so much fear and judgment. The nation of Israel is dealing with with threat and persecution from uh, the Assyrians. But throughout Hosea, you don't see a moment where Israel repents and turns But Hosea 14, verse four, it says, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely for my anger has turned from them. Israel didn't do anything, but God in his grace and his goodness says, I'm committed to you. And no matter what you do, I cannot break my covenant with you. Now church, here's the beautiful part. You and I have been brought into that covenant. So when he says, I will not leave you nor forsake you, he means it. Because you are sealed by who I am, not by who you are. God says you are sealed by my blood and nothing else. So as we kind of draw this to a close, I want us to dig into Ephesians chapter 2. Because during this series, we've talked about anxiety going to peace and fear coming to faith and guilt. Transitioning to forgiveness, hurt to healed, hate to love and now worried to assured. 
a divided mind to a covenant, a confidence, a certainty of faith. And I want to look at this. This is, oh, I love this. This is so good. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world. It doesn't say you were passed out. It doesn't say you were on life support. Dead. Dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. We all lived in sin. We have all lived in sin and dealt with the ramifications of that, the anxiety and the fear and the guilt and the shame and this burdens that weigh us down carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Hold on a second. But God being rich in mercy, it does not say because of your church attendance, because of how much of the Bible you've memorized, how long your prayer time is, how many times you've been on a mission trip, because of the great love with which he loved us. While we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. He initiates love and grace in our life. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hold on a second. It doesn't say that Jesus has raised us from the dead, pushed us out into the world and said, now struggle. No, no, it says he raises us up from the dead and then he wants to seat us with him in the heavenly places. That not only does he redeem us and pull us out of death, but he wants to make us co-heirs with Christ. Church, are, are we reading the same verse? Are, like, is everybody falling asleep? He raises us up and he seats us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So the immeasurable riches he lavishes on us. We are overwhelmed by his grace. We are consumed by his grace because of what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places he has blessed us with. And he gives that to us freely. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. I wanna really focus in the middle of this passage but God, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God being rich in mercy. So as we look at this series as a whole, this deep, clean series, and we think about this idea, but God. So we wake up and we're crippled by anxiety. We feel like we can't move, we can't breathe, we can't accomplish anything or get anything done. But God wants to bring you peace. That Hebrew word shalom, where we get peace, it means completeness or wholeness. He wants to make you complete amidst your anxiety. Your fear that weighs on you, that holds you up, that, that binds you. But God wants to break those chains of fear and bring you into a place of faith. The guilt and the shame that you carry and walk with. I want to I pause for a second here, church. I want you to think about this. Why would Jesus come out of the tomb with scars? Why would he have the nail holes on his hands and his feet? Why would he have the wound in his side? He didn't have the lashes. He didn't have holes in his forehead from the crown of thorns. But why, why those? Why? Church, it was always God's intent of this. Jesus did not resurrect and come out of the tomb without those wounds because it was never his intent to make it appear as if it never happened, 
But Jesus came out of the tomb with those scars because they were gonna stand as a symbol that he overcame death. Not that it didn't happen. So you might have wounds that need healing, but you're looking at that with guilt and shame and saying, I don't want this a part of my story. I regret all of this. And I'm not saying we should get to a place where we're proud of our past. But when we downplay our past, we minimize the gospel. And your wounds that the Lord heals and they become scars now stand as beautiful symbols of God's grace and goodness and love in your life. So we should make a transition away from guilt and shame to being forgiven. I've been hurt, I've been betrayed by people, but God has the ability to restore and redeem any and all relationships and bring healing. I have so much hate and anger and frustration, but God in the riches of his mercy is going to be love flowing through you. I have such a divided mind, my thoughts are so clouded, I feel so torn in different directions, but God, through a covenant sealed by him, is gonna give you a confidence and a certainty that you can lean in, into him, you can trust in him, and he is gonna give you clarity of mind. That regardless of what you are struggling with, the ramifications of sin that are still weighing over your life, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, it does not depend on us. He does it because he is God and he is good. You know, church, we treat our worship times, we treat church like an airport. We walk in on Sunday mornings, and what do you do when you get to the airport? You check your bags. So then when you walk through the lobby, someone says, hey, how are you? Fine, how are you? You can almost mean it because in that moment, you're not carrying your baggage. You checked it at the door. And we go on a little trip together. We worship, we get into the word. But what happens when you reach your destination? You just pick up your bags on the other side. And we leave with the same weight. We leave with the same baggage that we walked in with. Nothing ever really changes. Some of us are going to be given freedom and victory from some of these things, and it is going to be for a lifetime. And you may have struggled with anxiety and in God's goodness and grace, he may free you from that anxiety and give you peace for the rest of your life. And some of you, some of us are gonna have stories where it is a daily struggle. And the Lord brings healing to these areas of our life in different ways for different reasons. So we're gonna have a time to pray and we're gonna close in worship, but here's what I wanna challenge you with. Even if it's just for today, we're gonna pray and seek God and beg God to take that weight to give us an ability to leave our baggage here and not take it home. And I know that this doesn't happen often with actual airlines, but sometimes when you leave your bags at the airport, they like ship them to your house. And that may happen. You may leave a weight of hate here. And you're gonna open your door tomorrow and find it sitting there on your, on your stoop. You may leave baggage here and find it at your front door tomorrow. So what do you do tomorrow? You get on your face before God and you wait for that weight. You wait on the Lord for that baggage to be taken from you. So it might be a repetitive process, a daily struggle. Lay down your anxiety for today and walk in peace. Lay down your hate, even if just for a few hours to be able to come up for air and breathe in the love of God. And if you wake up tomorrow with baggage at your front door, do it again. And then you do it again the next day and the next day and the next day. But there's something in the church that we're uncomfortable with, at least in American church, but you see it time and time again in scripture when men of God, when prophets would come before the Lord in an utter fear, they would lay prostrate before the Lord. They would get on their face before God because they're just so unworthy of him. 
that they can't look at his face because he's so holy. But then God, in his grace, says, lift, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your heads. Do not fear. So I'm going to pray. And then you're going to pray. And if you are physically able, I want you to turn your chair into an altar. Get on your knees before God. Turn and kneel at your chair. And typically when we worship, we invite you to stand. And I want to charge you, don't you dare stand up until you are done wrestling with God, confident that at least for today, your baggage is going to stay here. So that when you stand to worship, you are standing in freedom. You're standing in victory. And you can worship him without the weight of those things holding you back. As I said, if it shows up at your door tomorrow, do this all over again. Father, I praise you. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for your goodness to us. That you have sealed us. You've sealed our faith, a covenant that you have made with us. You bless us with every spiritual blessing. We want to experience the fullness of who you are. We want to be able to even start to imagine the depth of your love and grace and kindness and mercy and goodness toward us. And the beauty of the gospel is it does not matter how we walked in here. If we walked in full of anxiety or fear or guilt or hurt or hate or worry, But God, being rich in mercy, wants to bring us peace and faith and forgiveness and healing and love and assurance because you are good. So Lord, help us get on our knees, on our faces before you and say, Lord, take this weight from me so we can take your yoke because your burden is light. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
of his glory for meeting with us today. Thank you for your presence here. Thank you for speaking to us, Lord. God, help us in this. This isn't a, a box we check, but God, it's something that we live in, Lord. And you can help us and you can lead us and we just thank you for that. God, thank you for the assurance that we do have in you and we know it in our minds so often i just pray that it would make that journey to our heart and we would just live from that place of freedom that you would help us do that god we just thank you for all that and so much more you are so good thank you thank you lord in jesus name amen it's been so good to be, get, be together today church family remember we got the worship night tonight